Hi, uh, this is David Hill, and I want to read you a book. Okay, The Coming Wave by entrepreneur Mustafa Suleiman, co-founder of DeepMind. Do you remember AlphaGo? Um, okay, this is what the book is about. This is a story of... 21st technology, 21st century technology, what matters so much and what we can do to make it work for everyone. Today, I'd like to read a few excerpts from chapter eight, the final chapter of the third of four parts. Um, let's see uh, Mustafa's thesis. Um, where, well, let's see where Mustafa's thesis fits in with the book. So the book has four parts um states nagada okay and part two has five chapters okay the technology of intelligence the technology of life a broader wave uh four characteristics of the coming wave and unstoppable incentives okay so the coming wave is about ai and technology in general including biology okay, so. and chapter eight sorry chapter eight has six subsections um which we can see okay it's about 41 pages long uh, the original korean book um is probably too long for a 50 minute video, so I'll skip a few parts. So we can look here to see the parts. Okay, so um, uh, the text was scanned from a paper book using Google Lens. Uh, you will notice a few spaces in wrong places and a few misspelled words. I also used Google Translate and will use, use it today to read um, the English text aloud. Um, there are several strategies you could use when reading or using Google Translate, for example. You can also look at my other video about hacking English, which I made last semester. Um, read the text in, Eng in Korean first and then in English. Two, read the text in English first and then in Korean to check your understanding. Um, three, like to, but afterwards read in English again, afterwards. Uh, four, uh, use those, you, other options include listening to the text only. So listening only, not without reading. Okay, so I recommend a mixture of strategies depending on what works for you. Uh, today I will adopt strategy one. Um, please pause the video if you need more time or slow it down. Um, uh, don't try to memorize, but make sure you comprehend, you understand um, the text, if you understand. Um, I've highlighted some words in bold and colors to match the corresponding parts in both languages. Okay, so. Please enjoy. Okay, so we've got the different text here. So um, I will copy parts of the text and put it into Google Translate. So let's see how much we can put in one go. Let's see. Oh, oops. Let's see, there we go. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Okay, and then we go to Google Translate. Uh, we want to have English. So let's just see if that see if this works. It's too long to translate. Let's let's see if it will read it for us. No, it's too long to read. Okay, so let's, let's be a bit more adventure. Uh, let's try and cut that back a bit. Okay. Um. Okay, let's go there. Yeah, I won't 
be showing you this next time, but let's see if this is if this works. Please let it work. Yeah, we got the speaker symbol. Okay, so let's play. Unstoppable incentives part of AlphaGo's significance was its timing. AlphaGo surprised experts by achieving results faster than most in the AI industry had expected. Just days before the first public match in March 2016, leading researchers thought that AI could not win at this level of Go. At DeepMind, we were not sure whether our program could win a match against a professional Go player. We viewed the match as an ambitious technical challenge and a starting point for broader research. In the AI industry, it was the first public test of deep reinforcement learning and one of the first studies to use large-scale GPU compute clusters. The press portrayed the match between AlphaGo and Lee Settle as an epic showdown between man and machine, the best minds in humanity pitted against the power of cold, lifeless computers. Let's stop the cliché metaphors of Terminators and robot overlords in science fiction movies. However, the tension that I felt faintly before the match became clearer as the match progressed. And another important aspect was revealed beneath the surface. AlphaGo was not simply a match between humans and machines. In the match between Lee Settle and AlphaGo, DeepMind appeared with the Union Jack, the British flag, while Lee Settle's side appeared with the Taeguk G, the Korean flag. It was a match between the East and the West. I felt regretful about this match, which contained the meaning of a national competition. It goes without saying that the match between Lee Settle 9 Dan and AlphaGo attracted a lot of attention in Asia. In the West, enthusiastic AI fans watched the match unfold and some media outlets paid attention to it. It was a pivotal moment in the history of technology and a very meaningful event for those interested in technology. Meanwhile, across Asia, this match attracted more attention than the Super Bowl. Over 280 million people watched the match live. A hotel in downtown Seoul that we rented was crowded with reporters from domestic and international media. It was difficult to move because of the hundreds of photographers and TV cameras. The fervent interest and enthusiasm for Go, which Westerners thought was something only math enthusiasts would enjoy, was an intensity that they had never experienced before. Needless to say, AI developers were not used to such a situation. In Asia, it was not only AI enthusiasts who watched the match. The public, tech companies, governments, and the military all watched with interest. The results shocked everyone, and no one took the significance of the result lightly. An American-owned Western company headquartered in London had literally planted its flag in the ancient and sublime game of Go and defeated the home team. It was as if Korean robots had appeared at Yankee Stadium and defeated an American all-star baseball team. To us, the game was a scientific experiment. A powerful and spectacular demonstration of cutting-edge technology that had been worked on for years. From an engineering perspective, it was exciting, thrilling, and embarrassing to be in the center of a media that reported on it with a focus on excitement. For many in Asia, the game was also a painful event that hurt regional and national pride. The AlphaGo Human Showdown did not end in Seoul. A year later, in May 2017, we played our second tournament, this time against KGIA, the world's number one ranked Go player. This match took place at the Future of Go Summit in Wuhan, China, and the response was strikingly different. Live broadcasting of the match was banned in China, and no mention of Google was allowed. The surrounding environment was more tightly controlled, and the narrative was strictly curated by the authorities. There was no more sensational reporting. And the message was clear. This match was no longer just a game. AlphaGo won again, but it was a victory in a tense atmosphere. Something had changed. If Seoul had provided a hint, Wuhan had made us realize the importance of AlphaGo. As the dust settled, it became clear that AlphaGo was part of a much larger story than a single trophy, a system, or a company. The great powers were engaged in a new and dangerous technological race, and there was a very powerful and interconnected set of incentives that ensured that the new wave would indeed come our way. Technology is driven by primordial and fundamentally human motivations. Technology is created to satisfy human needs, whether curiosity, crisis, luck, or fear. If people have a compelling reason to create and use a technology, it will eventually be created and used. However, in many discussions about technology, people get caught up in the definition of technology and forget why technology was created in the first place. The reason is not inherent techno-determinism, but rather what it means to be human.
National pride, strategic necessity after World War II, the United States took its technological superiority for granted. But Sputnik reminded us that this was not necessarily the case. In the fall of 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik, and became the first human being to enter space. The satellite, the size of a beach ball, was futuristic to the point of being almost unimaginable at the time. Sputnik was in the sky, allowing the world to see and hear the alien transmissions being beamed toward Earth. And the fact that it succeeded was an undeniable achievement. This was a crisis similar to the attack on Pearl Harbor for the United States. Policy responded immediately. Science and technology became a national priority from high school to advanced research institutes, and new funding led to the creation of new agencies such as NASA and DARPA. In particular, enormous resources were poured into major technology projects, including the Apollo missions. This led to several important advances in rocketry, microelectronics, and computer programming. Military alliances like NATO were also strengthened. And 12 years later, it was not the Soviet Union but the United States that succeeded in putting a man on the moon. The Soviet Union almost went broke trying to catch up with the United States. With Sputnik, the Soviet Union achieved a historic technological achievement that had enormous geopolitical ramifications. But when it was time to move ahead, the United States took bold action. Just as Sputnik ultimately led the United States to the path of superpower in rocketry, space technology, computing, and all other military and civilian applications, something similar is happening in China now. AlphaGo has quickly become China's Sputnik moment for AI. The United States and the West were threatening to seize the lead in groundbreaking technology, just as they had in the early days of the Internet. This was a stark reminder that China, having lost a go, could once again fall behind in cutting-edge technology. Zoom. In China, Go was not just a game. It had a wide range of meanings, combining history, emotion, and strategic calculation. China had already invested heavily in science and technology. But AlphaGo brought even more attention to AI. With thousands of years of history, China was once the center of global technological innovation. But it was keenly aware that it was falling behind Europe and the United States in technological competitions ranging from pharmaceuticals to aircraft carriers. In the words of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, it had endured a century of humiliation. The CCP vowed that it would never let this happen again. The CCP insisted that it was time for China to regain its place. At the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China in 2022, President Xi Jinping said, in order to meet strategic needs, China must safeguard science and technology as the greatest productive force, talent as the greatest resource and innovation as the greatest driving force. China's top-down model is one that can mobilize all of a country's resources to achieve its technological goals as intended. China now has a clear national strategy to become a world leader in AI by 2030. The Next Generation AI Development Plan, released just two months after KGIA's defeat by AlphaGo, was designed to achieve a joint mission among the government, military, research institutes, and industry. In the plan, China declares that it will make China the world's leading AI innovation center by 2030, ensuring that China's AI theory, technology, and application reach the world's top level. From national defense to smart cities, basic theories, and new applications, China should be at the top of AI. This bold declaration is not an empty promise. As I write this, just six years after China announced its plan, the United States and other Western countries no longer have an overwhelming lead in AI research. Schools like Tsinghua University and Peking University are competing with Western universities like Stanford, MIT, and Oxford. In fact, Tsinghua University publishes more AI research than any other academic institution in the world. China is making impressive progress in AI, accounting for an increasing share of the most cited papers. Since 2010, Chinese institutions have published 4.5 times more AI papers than U.S. institutions, more than the combined total of the U.S., U.K., India, and Germany. Quantum computing is a notable Chinese specialty. After Edward Snowden leaked classified information about U.S. intelligence surveillance programs, China became particularly vigilant about security and worked hard to build a secure communications platform. 
It was another Sputnik moment. In 2014, China filed as many quantum technology patents as the United States, and in 2018, it filed twice as many. 15 for decades. The West has been dismissing China's capabilities as uncreative, which is a very wrong thing to do. We have said that China is good at copying, that it is too regulated and not free, and that state-owned enterprises are bad. In retrospect, most of these assessments were clearly wrong. Even if they had some validity, they did not prevent China from becoming the powerhouse it is today in science and engineering. This is also because what was once a legitimate transfer of intellectual property, such as corporate acquisitions or academic journal translations, was often done through blatant theft, forced transfers, reverse engineering, and espionage. Meanwhile, the United States is losing its strategic edge. It's been a longtime leader in everything from semiconductor design to pharmaceuticals. The invention of the internet to the world's most sophisticated military technology. But it's losing that edge. And according to a report by Graham Allison of Harvard University, the situation is much more serious than the West realizes. China is already ahead of the United States in green energy, 5G, and AI. And is on track to overtake the United States in quantum and biotechnology in the coming years. 20 The Pentagon's first chief software officer resigned in protest in 2021. So disillusioned with the situation that he told the Financial Times, in 15 to 20 years, we won't be able to stand up to China. I think it's already, game over. The arms race technology has become the driving force of foreign policy rather than the instrument of foreign policy, and the world's most important strategic asset. The great power struggle of the 21st century is based on the competition for technological supremacy, that is, control of the coming wave. Technology companies and universities are no longer seen as neutral actors, but as champions representing the state. Political will can also play a role in impeding or eliminating other incentives explored in this chapter. In theory, governments can limit research incentives, crack down on private enterprise, and curtail self-directed initiatives. But the fierce competition with geopolitical rivals cannot be ignored. To limit technological development when rival states are surging ahead is to choose defeat in the logic of the arms race. I have long resisted the idea that technological development should be defined as a zero-sum international arms race. At Deep Mind, I have always resisted calling us the Manhattan Project of AI. Not only the nuclear metaphor, but also this frame could have triggered the start of many other Manhattan projects, which could have fueled the dynamics of an arms race in a situation where close global cooperation, break points, and speed control were needed. But the reality is that the logic of the state though simple, is by no means inescapable. When it comes to a country's national security, the mere suggestion of an idea can be dangerous. Once the topic of national security is mentioned, a gunshot is fired, and the mere mention of it can trigger a national reaction. And the situation can spiral out of control. Pretending is useless. The competition for hegemony with China is one of the few issues that has produced bipartisan consensus in Washington. The issue at hand is not whether we are in an arms race in technology or AI, but in which direction that race will go. The arms race is often depicted as a two-way race between China and the United States, but this is a short-sighted view. It is true that these two countries are the most advanced and resource-rich, but many other countries are also actively participating in the arms race. This new era of arms races will herald the rise of a broad techno-nationalism, in which countries will increasingly compete for decisive geopolitical advantage. Almost every country now has a concrete AI strategy. Vladimir Putin believes that the leaders in AI will become the rulers of the world. 24 French President Emmanuel Macron has declared that he will fight to build a European metaverse. He points out that Europe has failed to create the tech giants that the US and China have has failed to produce groundbreaking innovations, and lacks both intellectual property and manufacturing capabilities in key sectors of its tech ecosystem. Many, including Macron, believe that Europe's security, wealth, and reputation depend on becoming a third power point to six. The Manhattan Project, which cost 0.4% of US GDP during World War II, was seen as a race against time to get the atomic bomb before the Germans. But the Nazis didn't consider developing nuclear weapons because they were too expensive and speculative. And the Soviets were so far behind that they had to rely on massive leaks from the United States. 
As a result, the United States entered an arms race against a nonsensical illusion and delivered nuclear weapons to the world much earlier than they would have otherwise. A similar story occurred in the late 1950s, after the Soviets tested their ICBMs and Lon launched Sputnik. Pentagon decision-makers became convinced that the missile gap between them and Russia was serious. But later, a major report revealed that the United States had a 10-to-1 advantage. Khrushchev was simply following a proven Soviet strategy, the bluff strategy. The misunderstanding of the other country's intentions has led to the development of nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles decades earlier. Could this same misaligned dynamic be replicated in the current arms race? Not at this point. For one thing, the risk of technological proliferation is serious. As these technologies become more powerful, cheaper, and easier to use, more countries will be able to compete at the forefront. Large-scale language models are still considered cutting-edge. But there is no great magic or national secret hidden in them. Access to computation may be the biggest hurdle, but there are many services that can solve this. The same goes for CRISPR and DNA synthesis. We can already see real-time achievements like China's moon landing and India's Aadhaar, a biometric system for a billion people. It is no secret that China has a large number of LLMs, Taiwan is a leader in semiconductors, South Korea has world-class expertise in robotics. And governments around the world are publishing and implementing detailed technology strategies. All of this is happening publicly, shared through patents and academic conferences. It's being reported in Wired and the Financial Times and broadcast live on Bloomberg. Declaring an arms race is no longer some magical or self-fulfilling prophecy. It's happening right here. Right now. It's so obvious that it's not often mentioned. Technology is like an orchestra without a conductor, with no central authority controlling what technologies are being developed. Who's developing them, and for what purposes? And yet this one fact may end up being the most important of the 21st century. If the phrase, arms race, raises concerns, there is good reason to be. There is no more unstable foundation for technological progress than the perception or reality of a zero-sum competition based on fear. Nevertheless, there are more positive drivers for technological progress that should be considered. Knowledge that longs for freedom pure curiosity, the quest for truth, the values of openness, and evidence-based peer review are core values of scientific and technological research. Since the scientific revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries and the corresponding industrial revolutions, scientific discoveries have been shared openly through journals, books, conferences, and public lectures, rather than being hoarded like secret treasures. The patent system has provided a mechanism for sharing knowledge while providing compensation for risk. And widespread access to information has been the driving force of our civilization. Openness is a fundamental tenet of science and technology. What we know must be shared. What we discover must be published. Science and technology live and breathe through free discussion and information sharing. And openness has grown to become a powerful, and surprisingly beneficial, incentive in its own right. We live in an era of what Audrey Kurth Cronin calls, open technological innovation. 29 The global system for developing knowledge and technology is now so vast and open that it is nearly impossible to control, manage, or, if necessary, block. As a result, the ability to understand, develop, build, and apply technology is highly fragmented. The obscure work of a computer science graduate student one year may be used by hundreds of millions of users the next. It is difficult to predict or control. Of course, technology companies want to keep their secrets, but they tend to follow the open philosophy that is the hallmark of software development and academia. As a result, innovation spreads much faster, more widely, and more radically. The contemporary demand for openness has saturated the research culture. Academia is structured around peer review. And papers that have not undergone critical review by trusted colleagues do not meet the standards. Most funders do not like to support research that is locked away. Both institutions and researchers look closely at the number of publications and citations of their papers. The higher the number of citations, the higher the reputation and credibility, and the more research funding they receive. Junior researchers in particular are more likely to be evaluated and hired based on their research papers that are publicly available on platforms such as Google Scholar. Furthermore, papers are often published on Twitter and are often written with the influence of social media in mind. Such papers are written to attract attention and interest.
It is difficult to predict anything in a new field. There are many challenges to directing the research process, directing it toward a particular outcome, or guiding it away from a particular outcome, and controlling it in advance. In addition to the challenges of coordinating competing groups, it is also true that at the forefront, it is difficult to predict where breakthroughs will be found. For example, the CRISPR gene editing technology has its roots in the work of Spanish researcher Francisco Mojica, who wanted to understand how some single-celled organisms thrive in brackish water. Mojica stumbled upon the DNA repeat sequences that would soon become the core of CRISPR, and these clustered repeats seemed important. And he came up with the name CRISPR. Then, two researchers at a Danish yogurt company studied how to protect bacteria essential for the starter culture during the yogurt fermentation process. And this helped to show how the core mechanism of bacteria works. These unexpected methods of research became the foundation of one of the greatest biotechnology stories of the 21st century. In this way, a field of research that has been stagnant for decades can change dramatically in a matter of months. Neural networks were left in the wilderness for decades by prominent scholars like Marvin Minsky. Only a small number of isolated researchers, such as Jeffrey Hinton and Jan Le Kun, continued to study neural networks during a period when the word neural was so controversial that researchers deliberately removed it from their papers. Neural networks eventually came to dominate AI, even though it seemed impossible in the 1990s. However, it was Lacan who said AlphaGo was impossible just days before its first major breakthrough. 36 This is not to discredit him, but to show that no one in a new field of research can be certain about anything. Even in hardware, the path to AI was unpredictable. The GPU, graphics processing unit, is the fundamental building block of modern AI. However, GPUs were initially developed to provide more realistic graphics in computer games. As an example of the versatility of technology, fast parallel processing for creating gorgeous graphics turned out to be a good fit for training deep neural networks. The demand for realistic games led companies like NVIDIA to invest heavily in better hardware, and it was fortunate that that hardware was well suited to machine learning. NVIDIA was not unhappy about this. In the five years since AlexNet appeared, its stock price has risen 1000%. 37. In the past, if you were directing and directing AI research, you might have ended up stopping or promoting research that turned out to be pointless and completely missed the most important breakthroughs quietly happening around you. Scientific research is inherently unpredictable, very open, and fast growing. It is therefore very difficult to manage or control. Today's world is optimized for curiosity, sharing, and research at an unprecedented rate. Modern research is driven by the need or motivation to generate revenue, and it works against inhibition. The $100 trillion opportunity The first passenger railway opened between Liverpool and Manchester in 1830. This engineering marvel required consent to build and it had to deal with a huge number of difficult issues, including bridges, throughways, elevated sections over swampy terrain, and seemingly endless property disputes. The opening ceremony was attended by dignitaries including the British Prime Minister and Liverpool MP William Huskisson. During the celebration, the audience stood on the tracks to welcome the train as it approached. Unfamiliar with this amazing and wondrous machine, the crowd could not fully appreciate how fast the train was and to their horror, Huskisson was crushed under the wheels and eventually killed. To the terrified audience, George Stevenson's steam locomotive, the rocket, seemed like a modern, mechanical, roaring monster. But the steam engine took off faster than anything the world had seen at the time. Growth was rapid. It was expected to carry 250 passengers a day. But within a month it was carrying 1,200. 38 hundreds of tons of cotton could be hauled from Liverpool docks to Manchester mills in record time and with minimal effort. Five years later the railway was paying a 10% dividend, heralding the mini-boom in railway construction in the 1830s. 39 governments saw more opportunities, too. In 1844 a young MP named William Gladstone introduced the Railway Regulation Act to encourage investment. By 1845, companies were submitting hundreds of applications to build railways within a matter of months. Soon investors were flocking in, and with the stock market stagnating, railway companies were booming. At its peak, railroad stocks accounted for more than two-thirds of the total stock market value 0 .20 but within a year the market began to crash. By 1850 it had fallen 66% from its peak. Easy profits had made people greedy and foolish. Thousands had lost everything, but the boom had ushered in a new era. 
The advent of the locomotive shattered the old idyllic world into a sea of high-speed roads and tunnels, cuttings and huge stations, coal smoke and the sound of horns. The investment boom had given rise to a unified national network of a few scattered lines. This shortened domestic travel. In the 1830s, a trip between London and Edinburgh could take several days by uncomfortable stagecoach, by the 1850s it took less than 12 hours by train. The connections to other regions meant that towns, cities and regions could prosper. Tourism, trade and domestic life were transformed. In particular, the need for a standardized national time for understanding train timetables arose. And all this was made possible by the insatiable thirst for profit. The railroad boom of the 1840s was arguably the biggest bubble in history. But in the annals of technology, it was more the norm than the exception. The advent of railroads was not inevitable, but the opportunities to make money from them were. Carlota Perez argues that every major technology developed over the past 200 years, from the first telephone cables to the modern high bandwidth internet, has had a similar craze phase. While booms never last, Primal speculative desires create lasting changes in the new technological foundations. In fact, the curiosity of academic researchers or the will of ambitious governments alone is not enough to provide billions of consumers with new breakthroughs. Science must be transformed into useful and valuable products for widespread adoption. In short, most technologies are created to make money. If anything, this is perhaps the most persistent, certain, and scattered incentive. Profits drive Chinese entrepreneurs to develop completely new cell phone molds. Dutch farmers to find new robotics and greenhouse technologies that can grow tomatoes year-round in the cool climate of the North Sea. And savvy investors on Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto to invest millions of dollars in unproven young entrepreneurs. While individual contributors may have different motivations, the reason Google is developing AI and Amazon is building robots is because, as a publicly traded company with a responsibility to its shareholders, it sees AI and robots as a means to generate revenue. And the foundation of this profit potential is something much more enduring and solid, fundamental needs. People want and need the fruits of technology. They may need food, refrigeration, and communications to sustain their lives, they may want AC units. A new type of shoe design that requires complex new manufacturing techniques, an innovative way to color cupcakes, or any one of the many everyday uses for technology. Either way. Technology helps provide something, and developers get a fair share of it. The diverse needs and wants of humans, and the countless opportunities to monetize them, are an integral part of the history of technology and will continue to be so in the future. This is not a bad thing. Going back hundreds of years, economic growth was virtually non-existent, and living standards stagnated for centuries at much lower levels than they are today. But over the past 200 years, economic output has increased more than 300-fold. GDP per capita has increased at least 13-fold over the same period, and in the richest regions of the world it has increased 100-fold. In the early 19th century, nearly everyone lived in extreme poverty, now only about 9% of people worldwide do. Exponential growth in the human environment, once impossible, is now commonplace. The result has been a dramatic increase in productivity and living standards. Ultimately, there is little more valuable than intelligence. Intelligence is the source, conductor, designer, and facilitator of the global economy. The broader and more diverse the range of intelligence available to us, the greater our growth will be. A compelling economic scenario suggests that, generalist AI could not simply increase the growth rate, but could permanently accelerate it. Asterisk 56 in economic terms. AI could be most valuable in the long term when combined with the potential of technologies such as synthetic biology and robotics. This leads to the highly unusual and seemingly impossible scenario of rapid growth that could create infinite production in a finite period of time. Such investments are by no means passive. Rather, they will play a large role in the realization of another self-fulfilling prophecy. The trillions of dollars in investment funds will provide enormous added value and opportunity to society improve the quality of life for billions of people, and generate enormous returns for private interests. Either way, such active investment will provide a deep-rooted incentive to continue to discover, develop, and introduce new technologies. Global challenges throughout human history, the most important task has been feeding oneself and one's family. Farming has always been hard and uncertain. 
It was even harder before the technological advances of the 20th century. Changes in weather conditions, whether too cold or too hot, too dry or too wet, could be disastrous. Almost all the work was done by hand, with the help of oxen if one was lucky. At some times of the year, there was little to do, and at other times, weeks of hard physical labor were required. Crops were destroyed by disease or pests, spoiled after harvest, or taken by invading armies. Most peasants worked as serfs, giving up most of what they had harvested and barely scraping by. Even in the most productive regions of the world, yields were low and unstable. Naturally, life was hard and on the edge of disaster. In 1798, Thomas Malthus argued that a rapidly growing population would rapidly exhaust the carrying capacity of agriculture and lead to its collapse. His prediction was correct, and the prescribed yields actually followed the law most of the time. What he did not take into account was the extent of human ingenuity. In 13th century England, a hectare of wheat field could yield about half a ton of wheat, assuming good weather conditions and the use of modern technology. And it remained that way for centuries. But with the advent of new techniques and technologies, from crop rotation to selective breeding, mechanized plows, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, genetic modification, and now I optimized cultivation and weeding, everything is slowly changing. In the 21st century, yields are now around 8 tons per hectare. 58 that's 16 times more crops on small plots of land with the same terrain and soil that produced crops in the 13th century. In the United States, corn yields per hectare have tripled in the past 50 years, but the labor required to produce a kilogram of grain has actually decreased by 98% since the early 19th century. 60 in 1945. About 50% of the world's population suffered from severe malnutrition. Today, the world's population has more than tripled, yet malnutrition rates have fallen to 10%. It is hard to believe that more than 600 million people are still malnourished. On the other hand, if we calculate the rate in 1945, the number of malnourished people would be 4 billion. But realistically, we could not have fed all of them. It is easy to forget how far we have come and how amazing innovations are. What would a medieval farmer have thought of the giant combine harvester and the magnificent irrigation system used by modern farmers? They would have considered a 16-fold increase in crop yields a miracle. And indeed, it is. Feeding the world remains a tremendous challenge. But the need for this food supply has led to technological advances that have brought about a previously unimaginable abundance, enough food for 8 billion people on the planet. Even if it is not distributed properly. Technology is a critical part of solving the challenges that humanity currently faces and will continue to face in the future. We pursue new technologies not simply because we want them, but because we fundamentally need them. The world is headed toward a warming of more than 2 degrees Celsius. From freshwater use to biodiversity loss, the boundaries of the biosphere are being breached every moment of every day. Even the most resilient, temperate, Wealthy countries will experience catastrophic heat waves, droughts, storms, and water stress in the coming decades. Crops will be unharvested, and wildfires will run rampant. Melting permafrost will release massive amounts of methane, threatening to trigger a severe warming feedback loop. Diseases will spread beyond conventional boundaries. As sea levels continue to rise, climate refugees and conflicts will sweep the globe, threatening major population centers. Ultimately, ecosystems on both the ocean and the land will collapse. The problem facing humanity is not limited to this. We will also face other challenges, such as providing expensive health care to an aging population with chronic diseases. But there is another powerful incentive here. When we face seemingly impossible challenges, we gain a vital incentive to progress. New technologies have a powerful moral argument that goes beyond the profits or benefits. Technology can and will improve lives and solve problems. Imagine a world full of trees that live longer and absorb more carbon dioxide. Or phytoplankton that help the oceans become more powerful and sustainable carbon sinks. AI has made a major contribution to designing enzymes that can break down plastics clogging our oceans. It will also play a key role in predicting what will happen next. From guessing where suburbs will be hit to tracking deforestation through public datasets. We will soon see a world of affordable, personalized medicine, fast, accurate diagnostics, and energy-intensive fertilizers made by AI. Developing sustainable, scalable batteries requires groundbreaking new technologies. Quantum computers, combined with AI that can model down to the molecular level, could play a key role in finding alternatives to traditional lithium batteries.
These alternatives could be lighter, cheaper, more environmentally friendly, easier to produce and recycle, and therefore more plentiful. Similarly, Molecular level simulations have enabled the discovery of new compounds in solar materials research and drug discovery. This approach is far more accurate and effective than the time consuming experimental methods of the past. Hyperevolution is indeed underway, with the potential to leapfrog current research paradigms while saving billions of dollars in R&D costs. The naive techno solutionist school of thought believes that technology is the answer to all the world's problems. But it is not. Everything can change depending on how we create, use, own, and manage technology. We should not claim that technology is a magical answer to a multifaceted and huge problem like climate change. However, the idea that we can solve the challenges that will determine the century without new technologies is completely fanciful. We also need to remember that new technologies will make the lives of billions easier, healthier, more productive, and more enjoyable. They will save time, money, and inconvenience and save millions of lives. We should not trivialize or forget the importance of new technologies in the midst of uncertainty. The reason why a new wave is coming is also because we cannot navigate the reality we face without technology. Such a huge and systemic force is driving technology forward. However, in my experience, a more personal force, the self, is always present but is largely underestimated. Ego scientists and technologists are all human. They crave status, success, and achievement. They want to be the first to succeed, the best, and be recognized. They also have a competitive spirit and cleverness that has meticulously carved out their place in the world and in history. They constantly challenge the limits, sometimes for money, sometimes for glory, sometimes for themselves. AI scientists and engineers are among the highest paid professions in the world. But what really wakes them up is the expectation of being the first to develop a groundbreaking technology or have their name on a groundbreaking paper. Like it or not, tech titans and entrepreneurs are seen as unique beings with power, wealth, vision, and sheer will. Critics and enthusiasts alike see them as exceptional at expressing themselves and making things happen. Engineers often have a special way of thinking. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the director of Los Alamos, was a very principled man. But above all, he was a problem solver driven by curiosity. Consider this quote from the Bhagavad Gita. Famously quoted by Oppenheimer, he recalled the Hindu scripture, I am now death, the destroyer of worlds, after seeing the first nuclear test. When you find something that is technologically promising, you should put it into practice. And only after you have achieved technical success should you begin to wonder what to do and how to do it. 68 This was the attitude of John von Neumann. A Hungarian-American genius and fellow Manhattan Project member who said, what we are building now is a monster so powerful that it could change history, assuming that history survives. But we have to see it through to the end, not only for military reasons, but also because it would be unethical for a scientist to know that it is possible and not do it. No matter how terrible the consequences. 69 Spend any length of time in a technology environment and you will realize that despite all the talk about ethics and social responsibility, this perspective is prevalent even when confronted with technologies that have enormous power. And I would be lying if I said I have never succumbed to it, even though I have seen it many times. Making history, doing important things, helping others, winning over others, impressing potential partners, bosses, colleagues, and rivals is part of a constant drive to take risks. To push boundaries, to venture into the unknown, you have to create something new, to change the game, to rise to the top. Whether it is a lofty and noble ideal or a cold-blooded zero-sum mentality. When it comes to technology, this aspect often drives progress more than the demands of the state or distant stakeholders. Meet successful scientists or technologists and you will find people driven by their primal selves and driven by emotional impulses. This impulsiveness may seem naive or ethically questionable. But it is also an underappreciated aspect of why we can develop and acquire technology. There is a reason that the Silicon Valley myth of the heroic startup founder who built an empire alone against a hostile and ignorant world persists. It is a self-portrait that technologists still aspire to, an archetype to emulate, a fantasy that still fuels the development of new technologies. Nationalism, capitalism, and science are now inherent features of the world. It is impossible to simply eliminate them in a realistic time frame. Whether it is altruism and curiosity, 
Arrogance and competition, the desire to win, make a name for oneself, save people, and help the world, these are the driving forces behind the technological wave. And they cannot be eliminated or ignored. Moreover, the various incentives and elements of the new wave work together. The arms race between nations is intertwined with the competition between companies, while laboratories and researchers spur each other's development. In other words, a series of sub-competitions overlap and ultimately reinforce each other, forming a complex dynamic. Technology emerges as a complex, interconnected web of ideas. Driven by deep-rooted and distributed incentives, layered on top of each other by countless individual contributions. Without the tools to transmit information at the speed of light, people in the past would have had decades to realize the significance of new technologies. Even if we realized the implications, it took a lot of time and imagination to fully understand the far-reaching ramifications. But today, the whole world is watching everyone's reactions in real time. Everything is leaked, copied, repeated, and improved. And, because everyone is watching and learning from each other, and so many people are exploring the same areas. Eventually someone is bound to discover the next breakthrough. And it's virtually impossible to suppress it. Someone else will discover the same insight or find a similar approach to achieve the same result. People will never stop trying, whether for strategic potential, profit, or fame. That's why we don't reject the new wave. That's why new materials are coming, and why they're so hard to suppress. Technology has become an indispensable, massive system that affects every aspect of our lives, our society, and our economy. Without it, we can't do anything. Well-established incentives favor the proliferation of technology. No one has complete control over what this system of technology will do or where it will go. This is not some arcane philosophical concept, or an extreme deterministic scenario, or a visionary Californian technocentrism, but rather a basic description of the world we all live in, and have lived in for quite some time. In this context, the technological system feels like a giant slime mold slowly rolling toward an inevitable future, with countless small contributions from individuals, whether scholars or entrepreneurs. Without any coordination or resistance, and a powerful gravitational pull pulls the system. When obstacles appear, gaps open somewhere else and the systemic sphere rolls forward again. To impede the progress of this technology is to run counter to the interests of the nation, the corporation, and the research effort. This is the ultimate collective action problem. The idea that we can suppress CRISPR or AI is far-fetched. Until someone can come up with a compelling path to disentangle these interconnected incentives, there are no options to not develop them. To reject them, to simply slow them down, or to take a different path. Suppressing the technology means breaking all of these mutually reinforcing dynamics. It's questionable whether we can do this in the time frame that will allow us to influence the coming wave. Perhaps the only entity that can provide a solution is the nation-state. Which solidifies our political system and assumes ultimate responsibility for the technologies our society creates. But there's a catch. The nation-state is already burdened with enormous burdens and the coming wave is likely to make things even more complicated. The outcome of this conflict will determine the course of the rest of the century. Okay, well done. That was quite a lot to take in. I hope you got something from it. Okay, I'll post the link to the text of that so you can read it in your own time in the Korean. But uh, um, just to say, it's good to read both in English and Korean. So try, try and read books together. Um, Perhaps this book might have been a bit high level for you and had so many deep, deep ideas. But uh, please um, find some something you enjoy, some music, art, whatever, history, science, or I don't know, whatever. And try and read what you enjoy, um, both in English and Korean. And that way you can increase your um, understanding. So I look forward to seeing you in class. And please tell me, in the homework, in the summary um, form, summary fields of the form, uh, what you think of this video, please. Okay, thank you very much. And also leave a link in the comments below. Thank you very much.